Oops. Hello, I'm Andy. I've been interested in astronomy and space exploration all my life. I've been involved with various astronomical societies. I write articles for websites and magazines, and I lecture on such topics as gravitational waves and black holes. Welcome to Space Origins. Welcome to Space Oddities. My name is Kareem. I'm the Public Events Coordinator at the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's Montreal Centre, the Astronomy Prof here at John Abbott College, as well as a presenter every Tuesday night on the Global Star Parties by Explore Alliance. Our wonderful panel here is ready to share with you the world of astronomy and space, all the news, all the topics of the day, and we hope you'll join us. Hello, my name is Keith Mosley and I did a degree and a doctor. Doctorate in Earth Sciences at the University of Birmingham before becoming Head of Geology and Head of Physics at Monmouth School in Wales. I retired in 2015 but I carried on working for the Open University as an associate lecturer in astronomy. But now in retirement, I write educational materials for schools in Britain and also in Europe. Hi, I'm Mary. I'm an amateur astronomer, astrophotographer, astronomy sketcher, and an astronomy and space artist based in the UK. I have a really busy talk schedule talking about astrophotography and lots of other areas of astronomy. I run astronomy sketching workshops, I do outreach events, and I also do astronomy writing for magazines and books. I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys on Space Oddities. Hi, I'm Daz and welcome to Space Oddities. Over the last two years, I've been fortunate enough to work with this panel on astroradio.earth, talking space to the world. I also produce my own educational stroke documentary style programs. And being a jack of all trades and master of none, the content varied a lot. I would like to extend an invitation to you to join at me and the panel on Mondays, 8 p.m. UK time, where we can all sit and chat space. See you soon. Hello, this is Pete Williamson. Uh, I'm a retired professional astronomer, uh, founder of Astro Radio and Solar Sphere Astronomical Music Festival. Sadly, uh, Astro Radio is no more and this panel that we're all going to be part of uh, was born out of Astro Radio's reach out and touch space. So that's me introducing myself, there's nothing else to say. I'm a retired professional astronomer, still doing the odd talk, not doing too much these days, uh, but still doing the odd talk and I'll contribute to this, uh, this panel from time to time. So I hope to see you online very soon. Thank you very much. Hi, and welcome to the show. My name is Dave, and I reside in Liverpool, UK. I have followed all things space and astronomy since I was a little child back in the 60s. I've been a member of the Liverpool Astronomical Society for 46 years, and currently I am the Observatory Director. I'm involved in outreach work, and like many of you, I have that passion to share my knowledge with all like-minded people. Welcome aboard. I hope you enjoy the show, folks.
Hi, I'm Bernard. Welcome to Space Oddities. I'm a science writer. I'm published by Springer Publishing and I focus mainly on planetary science and space technologies. But I'm also a science speaker. Um, I do a lot of public outreach events for astronomy organizations in the UK and elsewhere. We're going to have so much fun on Space Oddities, so I hope you'll join us. Hi everyone, I'm Lou and welcome to Space Oddities. I'm a planetary scientist and professor of astronomy at Marymount University. I spent most of my career working on NASA space missions, working on NASA ground systems, and what I love most, creating space science education programs that reach people all over the world. I hope you'll join us as we explore the mysteries of space together on Space Oddities. Hello, my name is Roger. I live in the West Country in the UK. And since I've taken early retirement, I've taken up my love of astronomy back again. And I'm getting quite into astrophotography, especially lunar, solar, uh, planetary, and deep sky. So hopefully, if I can help anyone along with hints and tips, I'm, I may be able to give you some advice later on as we progress through our uh, groups in the many weeks and months to come. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rachel and welcome to Space Oddities. I'm here because like the rest of the panel, I'm passionate about astronomy. I love to share my passion with children and I do regular outreach events and talks with children and young adults. I also write articles for a magazine for young stargazers along with taking pictures of the night sky with my husband. I hope you'll join along for the astronomical fun. See you soon. Hello, I'm Simon and welcome to Space Oddities. I've been doing astronomy now since oh, the year dot. Um, I've been a member of several clubs and currently I'm helping out run Bath Astronomers in Somerset. I enjoy repairing telescopes and running outreach. So I hope you're going to enjoy Space Oddities as much as I am. Hi everyone, my name is Michael. I'm an amateur astronomer from the Midlands and I'm a member of the panel of astronomers on Space Oddities a new weekly chat show with a difference, featuring a panel of experts discussing all things astronomy. I have been interested in astronomy for most of my life. I enjoy learning everything that there is to know about this fascinating subject. I have been a keen member of astronomical societies, including working at council level. Although not an active observer, I enjoy following the various space exploration programs from around the world. I do hope you can join me and our panel of experts on the Space Oddities. Hello, hello, and uh, welcome to Space Oddities. Uh, this is a place where space enthusiasts and professional astronomers from all over talk about space topics and the latest news. Um, today we have a panel, a great panel of, uh, of guests. Uh, sorry, not guests, just a, a great bunch of panelists. And uh, the show will last for an hour and a bit, as usual. If you have any comments or questions, please put them in the in the comment section at the bottom of the screen. And uh, don't forget to like and to subscribe as well. Folks, we have a packed schedule today. So why don't we jump straight to DAS? Because I think uh, we had a question last week, which was not answered by City Space Astro. Daz, do you want to take us to it? Yes, um, welcome. And I see City Space Astro's in the uh, chat already. 
Um, I'd just like to say sorry for missing your uh, question last week. And basically it was, um, does anyone think we should be worried about micrometeor strikes on the James Webb Space Telescope? <clears throat> well, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, we, it was struck earlier this week, uh, earlier last week, um, and uh, it put a small ding in one of the, um, the mirrors, but it hasn't um, altered the uh, collimation or anything like that. So everything is working as it should be. Um, as regards um, meteorite strikes, um, everything that's in space is in, in peril of being hit by something. There's uh, dust, there's little bits of uh, grit running around, and there could even be the odd asteroid that could come powering through and just wipe it all out. But uh, micrometeorites, yes, they are a hazard, but it's nothing to worry too much about. All these things are designed to absorb these uh, micrometeor shocks. I mean, it's not the size of the object, it's the speed that they're traveling at um, that can actually cause the damage. So, I mean, the, the big um, mirror, uh, heat shield, that is all different types of fabric, but they've all been tested and um, made strong enough to absorb these uh, impacts. So, uh, yes, we should be worried, but don't be so worried that you're not going to sleep at night. So hope that answers your question. I think Great. the, um, the, the micrometeorite that did strike the web was, in fact, a little bigger than what they were anticipating. But as you said, it hasn't it hasn't had any effects on, on the uh, on the science or won't have any effect on the science. But I think it was just a tiny bit bigger than what they were expecting. So, so um, I mean, there's a classic example, isn't there, of, of the, um, the, fle the tiny fleck of paint that nearly put a hole through the windscreen of the space shuttle <laughs> and nearly went all the way through. Um, so, you know, these objects are traveling at phenomenal speeds and you only need a, a collision from a, something very tiny to, to, to wreck something big time. And that's the point, Andy. I, I, that's the that's the right point. That they were anticipating this. They knew this would happen. Yeah. Absolutely. And the 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 telescope as a whole is still functioning beyond the um, the specs that it was designed for. So that's good news. And um, I have a friend who was um, as a graduate student was doing something some work with the Hale Telescope, which used to be oh, the really? largest telescope in the world, the, the two hundred inch Hale reflector on Mount Palomar. And he dropped a wrench into it or a, a screwdriver or something. Ooh. Of course, he almost he almost died of a heart attack at that point. But it turns out, and yes, that did make a mark in the mirror. But it turns out that you really couldn't tell the difference in the imaging because it's because mm. the rest of the, you know, this huge mirror is doing its job. Mm. So um, uh, the, the official word from NASA is they, they anticipated this. Nothing sure. to worry about. And it will happen again, of course. Yeah, great. Thank well, it sounds like a horror story there, Lou. Thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, thanks, Das, for uh, for replying to uh, to uh, City Space Astro's question. No, that's, that's great. Fine. That's fine. Right. So uh, let's move on to this week's uh, show. We're going to start with Roger, who's going to go uh, through uh, through some moon phases and the upcoming planet positions. Roger, I think you're on mute. <laughs> I'm mute. Right, okay, so I shall now give my presentation. Right. Okay, so here we go for this week's Moon and Planets from the 20th to the 26th of June. Okay, so we're um, gradually diminishing. We're going from a uh, Whack, a waning uh, gibbous to a waning crescent by the end of uh, by the end of the next weekend, with a third quarter happening tomorrow, and uh, I will be uh, mentioning a little bit more about the moon in a moment with the uh, planets as well. So we had a full uh, super moon uh, this month, being the strawberry moon. Uh, as known in America, and uh, this was my mineral version of that image, uh, the night uh, of the of that moon, although it was at 10 to 1, uh, about midday, so as you can see it's starting to get d diminish, even though it was only 99.4%, so that's what that was that night. 
So we have in the wee hours of the morning, round about four o'clock, we have five planets and a moon to uh, enjoy in the uh, east and southeast skies of the northern hemisphere. As you can see, they're uh, quite well spaced apart. But as we go through the week, the moon slowly slides across between Saturn, Jupiter, and between Jupiter and Mars, and on towards Venus, which gets quite close on the 26th. And uh, if you're very, very lucky and you've got good eyesight and a very low horizon, you might spot Mercury as well, which uh, is not something that I have seen very much of. Right, so we have the Mercury quite low down, then Venus, then the Moon. This is obviously drawing the middle of the week. Mars, Jupiter, and then Saturn across over on the right. So I'm hoping to, over the next few uh, wee hours of the morning, to do a try and do a sequence of, of these images. And if you if I'm if I'm lucky, you might see something next week regarding those uh, events. So watch this space. So uh, we've got five planets up and visible during the uh, morning, but unfortunately in the Southern Hemisphere, they've only got uh, three and a moon because uh, Venus and Mercury are uh, too far down below the horizon. So uh, never mind, they had their time uh, a week or so back. So now it's our turn to uh, show, show how many planets we can see. And as you can see on the 22nd, we've got a close, uh, Close, close flyby, so to speak, of the moon going past Jupiter on the 22nd. And this is uh, early, early uh, wee hours of the morning uh, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere as well. So uh, there we go. And Thank you. you. And, and then it gradually disappears. There we are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that, Roger. I was saying earlier uh, while we were waiting for the show to go live that uh, talking about um, uh, sky events, uh, I live near uh, Avebury Stone Circle in the southwest of the UK, and uh, I'm going to wake up very early this morning to go and see the, uh, the sunrise at 429 and uh, amidst the stones and, uh, and all the great people and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and loads of policemen as well. So uh, I'll, maybe I'll be able to take some pictures and, and uh, share with you guys next week. Thank you so much, okay. Roger. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Bernard, cool. can I, yes. uh, I'm wondering, Roger, can you just mention a little bit of the equipment that you use for that beautiful mineral moon that you got? Uh, we'd love to just get even just a short insight and then maybe we can do something bigger down the road. Okay, let me just go back to that image and I'll quickly go through with you on that. Okay, uh, let me just get back to that presentation a moment. And I remember last week when you showed the photos, there were a few comments in the, uh, in the chat on YouTube asking about that and how you get such crisp views of the craters and the... Okay. Um, yeah. Right, hang on. Right. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right. Yeah. So um this was done with my five inch refractor and uh I uh, did a video clip, uh, an SER type video, which I captured with SharpCap and then processed it through um, uh, AutoStackert. Once the uh, pictures have all been aligned and saved as a TIFF, I then process it through Photoshop. Now I gradually build the color separation up when I'm using the Adobe Camera Raw filter in Photoshop, I just gradually ease the vibrance and the saturation uh, selectively to just bring it out gradually, bit at a time, bit at a time. And then uh, I just adjust it to, to my own taste. Uh, I try not to make it too much like Wizard of Oz with brilliant blues and vivid reds or anything that I have seen uh, otherwise but uh, I tried to do it subtly which 
I hope I've achieved. It's absolutely it's beautiful, image. Roger. It's a fantastic image. Yes. It and really is. If anybody gets a chance to see it on Facebook, if you actually zoom in to the to the edge, you can see such beautiful detail. I think <clears> if you if you follow this for several months, you'll see the libration and you'll see craters come into view and then out of view. I'm hoping because I've done so many hundreds of pictures, I've got more than enough to do a full cycle with a, showing the libration. And uh, I hope to present that at some point. Good librations. Yes. <laughs> well cool. done, Roger. Fantastic. Thank you. Well done. Uh, I'm going to do a bit of selling here, but uh, when I, in my first book where I talk about um, the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, um, I was comparing them to, to our moon, and I did mention the sentence that our moon looked quite dull. Um, and uh, if only I could go back and retract that, uh, that sentence, because every time I see these amazing pictures, I'm just like, oh, what a mistake. Anyways, um, thank you so much for that, Roger, and great question, Kareem. Uh, I believe we have Lou now, who's going to be talking to us about, uh, about exoplanet detection. Uh, thank you, Bernard. Uh, I want to preface all this. Um, I, uh, I uh, am on a trip right now. I'm driving my EV across country from Maryland to uh, Milwaukee, about half, not quite halfway across the United States. And I've stopped in at an EV charge station and it's raining and I'm sitting in my car and I couldn't get connected at first. And oh my goodness, I thought this will be a miracle if it works. So um, so, but here I am, and uh, let's see well what we done, can Luke. do. That's great. Thanks <laughs> well for done, repping so, it. <laughs> well done so far. I was on the uh, new, um, Pennsylvania Turnpike, and for those who, who don't know this, it's the longest stretch of road with no exits ever, 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 <laughs> ever. And so I thought, I'll never get off. I'll never, you know. <laughs> so, the wonders um, of space technology, Luke. Yeah, like yeah. traveling in the twilight zone. <laughs> okay. But it's a beautiful highway. It goes in through some of the mountains, not just around. It is, it is beautiful. It, I'm in the mountains of um, Pennsylvania, which uh, makes it a miracle itself that I have any kind of signal. I'm hot spotting my phone. So um, in either event, let's see if I can share my screen uh, here. Let's just see what we can do from this kind of ragtag solution. It's looking good. Yeah, we can okay. see that. Let me see if I can do a slideshow. Does that still show? Still there, yeah. Yep. Slideshow, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There it is. Okay. Oh, okay. There it is. Yeah, that's it. Good. So um, uh, today I'm starting a series on uh, exoplanet discoveries, planets around other stars, other worlds outside our solar system. The uh, of course, the, the driving um, motivation for this, uh, besides just uh, general curiosity, is are we alone? Are we alone in the universe? Maybe the, the greatest question that is yet, yet, to be, um, yet to be known or to be solved, are we alone? So um, the, the history of exoplanet detection is, is fascinating and with um, uh, errors and uh, missteps, uh, but today we know of over 5,000 planets around other stars and, and it appears that stars with planets are the rule rather than the exception. So the series that we're gonna to start today uh, is um, about the different uh, ways we've thought about uh, worlds around other stars, the detection methods we use, the technologies, what those worlds are like, what stars they're orbiting. And of course, um, do they appear to be habitable? Could they be uh, uh, places where life could, uh, could develop? So today we're going to start, obviously, with the screen. We're going to start not so much with the science, but with the philosophy, because the, um, the, the human condition, are we alone, the, the, the human nature, it has um, asked this question for thousands of years. And there have been some notable uh, philosophers who have um, pondered this. Okay, So again, this isn't science. It's, it's not building observation and theory and testing it multiple ways. This is just kind of thinking about things. Uh, so I have some um, interesting uh, quotes here. Uh, Talus of Miletus. Now Miletus uh, was in Greece, I think at the time, 
and then uh, this is you know 2,500 years ago, and is now on the um, uh, coast of Turkey. And he said, the stars are other worlds. Earth and everything beyond has a common physical basis. This was an incredible statement because uh, up until then and quite beyond that point, the prevailing thought was that the heavens are pure and pristine because they are the heavens and the, the, the uh, residents of the gods. And down here with the unwashed masses on earth, the physics are different. So this was an incredible statement. Um, let's see, uh, an ex-commander of Miletus, again, Miletus, uh, 2,500 years ago or so, he said, Earth is a cylinder. Sun and stars are fires trapped in globular masses by cooler air. What an interesting thought. I mean, he, how do you dream this stuff up? Um, Diogenes uh, actually uh, kind of got it right. Well, he got right and wrong. He, he thought air was intelligent. And I'm not sure how he came up with that. But um, he also believed that there were infinite worlds out there in the universe, uh, an infinite number of worlds, and that, uh, that the meteorites that we see, the, the meteor showers that we see came from space. There was a lot of debate over whether they were atmospheric or space-born. Um, Aristotle, who you know, we regard as, as a very wise uh, philosopher, he kind of got it wrong. He said, uh, the world contains all the material there is with nothing left over to form any other worlds. So these are just, you know, it's interesting thinking and unclear how they came about these thoughts. Um, but finally, Isaac Newton, uh, in his uh, great work, The Principia, uh, said that um, if there are other systems out there, other planets, other stellar systems, they will all be constructed according to a similar design and that is very similar to the statement of Tallis that said that the physics of the universe is the physics of the earth and everything is put together in quite the same way. Now I've saved the best for last because this is my hero. Uh, I, I actually dress up as this guy for Halloween and his name is Giordano Bruno. And Bruno uh, was, a, uh, was a contemporary of uh, Newton and others. And he believed that the sun was a star, just like the stars you see in the night sky, and that plan the, the planets orbited the sun. That was not, that was still a matter of debate. And that there are many stars and many stellar systems and that there are planets and that there could be life on these planets. Now he was kind of a rogue guy. Okay, he uh, believed in freedom of religion. He believed you should judge people by their deeds and not their, their works. Um, and so um, he was actually quite ahead of his time. And so for that, there he is, there's Giordano Bruno. And here on the lower left, he's brought up in front of an inquisition from the church who really didn't like what he was saying um, and uh, labeled a heretic. And so he was executed. Um, and here's a famous painting with uh, Bruno on the left in the white garb and, this, and the crosses and the church co going to tie him to the stake and, and burn him alive, uh, which brings to mind the, the great quote by Max Planck, who said, science progresses funeral by funeral, right? So it takes a lot of courage to, you know, buck, buck the system. Um, we generally believe that 1995 was the first detection of a planet around another star. Actually, I'll get to that in just a second. But in fact, there was a detection of a planet around another star in 1917. Who knew? Um, uh, this is uh, uh, an astronomer. His name is uh, Van Manam. And he was looking at um, high proper motion stars, stars that appear to be moving rather fast across our line of sight, which means they're rather close. And he noticed one that was rather dim that he didn't quite understand. And so he took a spectrum of it. Now this is back in 1917. They knew very little about stars at that point. In fact, at that point, they didn't even know the galaxy was one of many galaxies. We thought that was all there was. The upper left shows the spectrum of that star and uh, the two black lines on top and bottom, thick black lines are, reference, are references. And the thin line that's broken up in the middle uh, is showing an iron line, iron in the atmosphere of a star, very unusual. 
very unusual. The spectrum in the bottom right, uh, uh, bottom right is um, showing uh, a, a better spectrum of that star that was taken later, showing calcium and magnesium and iron. And what's unusual about that is this uh, star is a white dwarf, a star much like our sun that ended its life and uh, uh, contracted to a dense mass and has some convection going on. And uh, there should be no metals on the surface. These things eventually over a period of tens or hundred thousand years should make their way as heavy material down to the core of the star. And that means that something's going on replenishing these materials in the surface of the star, which is where we're seeing them. And that means that um, uh, this, this uh, star was once the, uh, the sun of a planetary system and that you probably have uh, meteorites or other things that are falling into the star replenishing its heavy elements on the surface. So I will end today. This is just the first in the series with um, in fact, the first discovery of um, a planet around another star. And this was um, a beta pictoris, or if you're in a science convection with a lot of nerdy astrophysicists, they'll, they'll just say beta pic. Um, and uh, this uh, is a, um, uh, this was a pulsar, a, new, a rotating neutron star. It was discovered that the very regular pulses from the star, from the radio emission from the star, uh, would vary a little bit. And they were varying because there's a planet orbiting a star, pull, pulling it away from us, pulling it towards us, and changing its distance. Therefore, we received its signals at different times. So this is the beginning of our understanding that there are in fact verifiably, observably planets around other stars. And in the weeks to come, we're going to be looking at the technologies that have uh, brought us to the point where there are now over 5,000 planets we've observed and detected around other stars, how we've done it, what those planets are like, and could they harbor life? And so I'll, I'll just leave it there, hopefully with a tantalizing message and um, and we'll resume next week. Thanks, that's, Lou. That was great. That's great. Thank you, Lou. I have a very important question for you. Um, <laughs> when you dress up as Giornano Bruno on Halloween, <laughs> do you shave your whole beard and just leave that little <laughs> nice mustache that you had? <laughs> uh, perhaps I don't do it justice. Uh, I, um, I put on robes and a, a hat that is of the era. And then out of construction board, I make flames um, and put flames all over me. So, and then I ask people to guess who I am and nobody knows. <laughs> Does this mean that we're going to have a Halloween themed space oddities? Yes. Sounds like it. It's That's good idea. to plan one That's for October. Yeah. I love it. Lou, could, I, could we ask you to uh, stop sharing your screen? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there we Thanks. go. Thanks. There we are. We're all back now. There, that sounds like a grand idea. Space oddities for Halloween. We'll, we'll do it, yeah? Why not? We'll be yeah, there. go for it. It's that could actually holiday. be the version of the quiz that week is, you know, guess, yeah. guess who it we are. Be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and speaking of that, um, I'd like to announce to, uh, to our viewers, next week we're going to do something different. We've got something very nice lined up for you next week because next week, Monday at 8, as always, UK time, it's quiz night. And we'd like to give you a quiz as a bit of fun only. And um, we'll give you the details next Monday. But uh, all you need to know is that you need paper and pen for next Monday. We're going to have a fun quiz and, uh, and just, just, just to do something different, just to have a bit of fun. So next Monday is quiz night and um, bring your paper and pen and, uh, and we'll do it. There we are. Thanks. Uh, Andy, can you remind everyone, what, do the, what, does, the, uh, what does the person win? What's the grand oh, prize? What does the person win? Well, a, 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 apart from our recognition. Yeah, they, they win the uh, ultimate recognition of being top dog at uh, Space Oddities. And that should be <laughs> yeah. enough for anybody, to be quite honest with you. Uh, um, yes, yeah, so, uh, um, we're not offering any physical prizes. Yeah. Um, or we could offer a night out with Daz. Uh, <laughs> Two, you just beat me to it. I was, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, second prize, two nights out with Daz. I'm <laughs> <laughs> not desperate, but there you go. I'll take anything. <laughs> yeah, we'll, uh, yeah, but uh, no, it's, just, it's just a bit of fun. And uh, we, we'd like you all, this, uh, viewers, to, to take part. 
if you would. So grab your paper and pen next Monday. And uh, we haven't quite decided what format it's going to take, but it will be fun. We can promise you that. So that's what we'll do next Monday to celebrate uh, the onset of summer, finally. So, so there you are. Thanks, Andy. Uh, since we're with you, Andy, uh, I think you had some things to share about neutron stars. Yes, it's, yes. Lou was just talking about uh, neutron stars. And um, you may remember if you were watching last week, uh, viewers, that I, I started to talk about uh, neutron stars. And um, I decided just to take things a bit further because it would have been too long for last week. So let me just uh, share my screen. I'm going to talk to you a bit more about neutron stars because uh, I'm absolutely fascinated with them. And, um, and I hope you will be as well. So where did we get to last week? Well, um, we have, um, let's just do a bit of a recap for those who weren't watching last week. So a neutron star is essentially the dead core of a massive star that remains after a supernova explosion. And depending on the mass of the star, the initial mass of the star, it can end up as either a neutron star, or if the star had enough mass, it would collapse directly into a black hole. But neutron stars are the dead cores of, uh, of stars. And if you think that the dead core of a star may be you know, hundreds of thousands of kilometers in diameter, uh, neutron stars are what's left when gravity has compressed the uh, neutron star down to something, you know, uh, just a few kilometers across, 11, 12, 13 kilometers across. Now, because they, uh, the, the neutron star has been compressed so much, it is ultra dense, which means that one teaspoonful of neutron star material would weigh 4 billion tons. This is how dense that material is. And the other characteristic is that they have immense gravity, about a thousand billion times the strength of the Earth's gravity. And if you were to drop a ball onto an average 12 kilometer diameter neutron star from a height of one meter, by the time that ball hit the neutron star, it would be traveling at 1.4 million miles per second, uh, meters per second. So this is uh, a bizarre object, some of the most bizarre objects in the universe. Now, um, let's have a look at some examples which are quite distinctive. So these are my pulsars of distinction. Now, pulsars shoot out beams usually of radio energy from their magnetic poles. And if the Earth intercepts one of these beams, we see it as a flash of, of radio light. And because these poles are often not aligned with the axis of rotation of the neutron star, they sweep the sky like lighthouses. And uh, if the Earth intercepts one, we see it. So there are probably lots of pulsars we don't see because their beams aren't aimed at us. Now, the fastest rotating pulsar is this one, PSR J1748. It rotates 43,000 times per minute. This is the current record holder. So it is definitely a pulsar of distinction. Uh, PSR J0030, uh, this was the first neutron star to have its surface actually mapped. And you're looking at the surface of a neutron star that has been uh, mapped by some very sophisticated telescopes. Now, interesting thing to note, um, the white patches that you see rotating around the neutron star, these are so-called magnetic hotspots. These are where the magnetic field the, that intense magnetic field of the, uh, the pulsar is anchored, if you like. On the Earth, we have the North Magnetic Pole and the South Magnetic Poles. They're not too far from the North Geographic Pole and the South Geographic Pole. But these uh, white patches indicate that the North and the South Poles, if you want to put it like that, of the neutron star, they're all in the Southern Hemisphere of the neutron star, which is incredibly bizarre. And this must generate an in incredibly complex magnetic field, really strange object. Um, the, then we have another pulsar distinction was the famous pulsar in the Crab Nebula. And the Crab Nebula is a supernova remnant. It was seen to explode in the sky by Chinese astronomers in the year 1054 AD. It was so bright, it was visible in daylight and was sketched by the 
the Chinese astronomers. But if we look at a modern X-ray image taken with the Chandra Space Telescope, this is an animation of that very pulsar. Um, and you can see the, the radiation pulsing away from it in all directions. And um, it's just an incredible uh, set of images. Uh, now, the um, other thing about the crab pulsar is it was the first pulsar to be identified optically because the crab pulsar also emits visible light as well as radio light. And here, in a much slowed down video, because it flashes about 30 times a second, you can see the crab pulsar actually flashing in visible light. And you could see that if you had a powerful enough telescope at, at home. So some pulsars do emit light as well as radio waves. Well, radio waves are light, of course, but optical light as well as radio light. And then we move on to magnetars. Now, magnetars are bizarre neutron stars. They don't have the lighthouse-like beams of pulsars, but they do have incredibly strong magnetic fields. Now, characteristically, there are no pulsar beams. They have intense magnetic fields. They have unpredictable outbursts of energy, um, which are incredibly strong. These outbursts last milliseconds, but release the energy of thousands of stars in just a few milliseconds. And uh, these are um, neutron stars with characteristically an incredibly strong magnetic field. And they are a candidate for um, a bit of an astronomical mystery called the fast radio burst or FRBs. These are radio pulses coming from all over the sky every day, lasting a few milliseconds, but emitting the energy of thousands and thousands of stars in those few milliseconds. And at least one of them we know of in our own Milky Way galaxy has been tracked down to a magnetar, but uh, astronomers aren't convinced that all FRBs are caused by magnetars. There may be several different uh, objects creating them. Time will tell. Now, I said that magnetars have an incredibly strong magnetic field. It's so strong, it could lift the keys out of your pocket uh, from as far away as the moon. That's how strong the magnetic field is. And they're also very dangerous objects because if you were a spaceman uh, and you got within about 10,000 miles of a magnetar, what would happen to you is that you would die um, because um, what would happen is that the electrons would be stripped away from the atoms in your body by that incre incredible magnetic field, and you would basically dissolve. Uh, be, uh, you'd just be left as a, a floating cloud of uh, disassociated ions. Uh, so that uh, a warning to you all, stay away from magnetars. They're not, they're not nice. And then lastly, we have some other odd beasts that we don't really understand, which are grouped together under the name transients. And these are very slow rotating pulsars, um, and they exhibit some of the characteristics of pulsars and some of magnetars, and we're not quite sure yet what they are. This one, for example, PSR J1846, um, it does spin three times a second. It does have beams like beams of radio energy like a pulsar, but it also has periodically violent outbursts of energy like magnetars. And this one, uh, this is the slowest rotating pulsar yet discovered. It rotates once every 76 seconds, which is incredibly slow rotating. We don't understand why the or how and why these pulsars end up rotating so slowly. We assume that it's because of their immense age, but PSR J0901 is only, only inverted commas, 56 million years old. So there's something going on here with these pulsars that we, we don't yet understand. As I said, they are very bizarre objects, uh, neutron stars, and we've got a lot to learn uh, yet. And um, it's not, years ago we thought it was all cut and dry, we understood we have a neutron star, some are pulsars, some aren't, but there are these sort of hybrid beasts that are a bit like pulsars, a bit like magnetars, some of them are incredibly slow rotating, we don't understand what's going on yet, and there's a lot more work to be done there. So there you are folks, I just thought I'd, um, I just thought I'd um, tell you the, a bit more about neutron stars for today. Hope you enjoyed that. Cool. Thanks, very Andy. Good. Very good, Andy. Yeah. yeah. I think we have a question from Keith. Yes, Keith. Yeah. Uh, actually, I uh, yeah I read somewhere that uh, 
uh, neutron stars, magnetic fields are so intense they can wipe your credit cards at 250,000 miles. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so right. I don't know if it's That's true right. or not, but, but there no, no, are, that, but, that is absolutely true. And, and yeah. uh, you know, as I said, they can pull the keys out of your pocket from that distance as well. So, yeah, uh, the, uh, yeah, it was another thing, and uh, that is these uh, anomalously rotating uh, neutron stars. It, 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 the, the smoking gun is probably a binary companion, another star we haven't mm. detected that's affecting their rotation. It could be, but as you say, none have been mm. detected so far. And, yeah, indeed. Um, yeah. And, and to make matters more bizarre, um, mm. they are in areas where there shouldn't be any neutron stars. Um, mm. they're, they're popping up in, in places you wouldn't expect to find neutron stars. So we've got a lot to learn yet, mm. definitely. Mm. Steve? Yeah, genuine query this. Uh, presumably, um, if it's kind of like a solid ball of neutrons, effectively, the core... Mm it doesn't generate its energy like a conventional star would by fusing one, en one element into no. another. Mm. Is, it, is it the interaction of the particles with the magnetic field that creates the energy yes. and the visible yeah. light? It's all down to the magnetic field. Uh, because mm. what happens as the, uh, the dead star, if you like, the core of the star is compressed by gravity, its electrons are thrust into its protons uh, creating neutrons so that the star is is made of uh, neutronium incidentally um the uh, periodic table of elements has number one as hydrogen um because it has one uh, one proton um neutronium is now number zero in the periodic table of elements because mm. it doesn't have any protons because yeah. they were converted into neutrons so if you look at the periodic table elements, you've got to put neutronium as, as zero. And, and it's N, N, NEU, I think the abbreviation is. NEU is a neutronium. Uh, and it's number zero in the periodic table. There we oh, are. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. That's another one. <laughs> uh, Keith again. Go on, Keith. Sorry, I'm butting in again. No, yeah, no. yeah. Uh, the uh, radio waves emitted from uh, neutron stars, uh, I believe they're caused by electrons spiralling down through the magnetic field um, and they're emitting synchrotron that's radiation right. in the form of radio waves. Yeah, that's right. Just so yeah. Yeah, it's all synch know. synchrotron yeah. radiation. Yeah. 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 Mm. Wow. All fascinating stuff. I, I just can't wait mm. until uh, until we see uh, a next Hollywood blockbuster with uh, with our hero uh, getting near a neutron star and saying, my gosh, my credit cards have been wiped. <laughs> 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 you saying that, uh, Barnard? Isn't there a film come out or something that's just popped out that uh, something about a neutron star in the moon or something? I, oh, I did think you I've seen... Moonfall. Moonfall. Oh. Yeah. Is there something? Um, yeah. Did I read that right? You know, is a. Yes. It's, I mean, it, it would be wonderful if it's true. It's it? hey, done by the same guy who did 2012 <laughs> and several other uh, dumb disaster movies, and, mm. uh, and I was I was watching Mark Commode on the TV uh, reviewing it. And he said it's so gloriously dumb. He said it's the dumbest film you could ever ever see. He said that it's actually quite enjoyable. So, um, so, so there we are. You can go, go and pick the science apart in that. Yeah, I think there's a question just popped up um, from Bath Astronomers. It says, "Do neutron stars have cracks due to such high forces?" Um, right. No, is the answer um, because the gravity doesn't permit anything like that to exist. In fact, you have, you have mountains on the surfaces of neutron stars, but they're only about a millimeter high. That would be classed as a mountain on, on a neutron star because of the intense gravity. So I don't think cracks would be permitted. I may be wrong, though. But, Did you say um, a millimeter high? Yes, yes. Okay, then that's one I can climb, then. Yeah. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that, Andy. My yeah. pleasure. Thanks. And, and as a reminder to our viewers, you can always uh, put comments and uh, questions and we'll definitely follow through. Yeah, definitely. Um, put, put, yeah. put your comments uh, and questions in the, in, in, the, in the live chat. And then after, after we've finished today, you, you can always go in and put them in the comments afterwards as well. And don't forget to like and subscribe, please. Please subscribe to us. We're really nice people, honestly. And, Indeed. Uh, We'd love to have you as subscribers so we can carry on and do even better things. Oh, so needy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, 
<laughs> since since we're with you again, Lou, I'd like to take us back to Lou. Oh, thank thank you. Just a, a small correction. I got a bit ahead of myself. Getting so excited about this series, Beta Pictoris. Uh, in fact, is a main sequence star, a little more massive than our sun. And it was the first detection of a debris field around another star. It has belts where the material seems to be cleared away. Uh, it has uh, uh, evidence of uh, higher order, uh, what we call metals uh, material. But um, the first planetary detection was in fact uh, around a, uh, a pulsar, as we just found out about pulsars. And that pulsar had the descriptive name PSR B1257. So remember that name, that's his historic name. Yeah. Uh, and we'll, um, this was a sneaky way of getting to do my, the rest of my series today, but we will, we will continue this later. The, the next ways. thing about that was that nobody expected planets to be found around a pulsar because a pulsar is a, is a supernova remnant. And how could the planets have survived the supernova? Mm. That, that's yes. the question. Yeah. Um, well, maybe that they, they it, it could be that they didn't. And in fact, they're just, there's uh, some debris field of meteor, uh, ast small asteroids or, or yeah. something like that material just falling on to yeah. the surface. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Lou, for that clarification. Yep. Thanks, Bernard. Yeah. Um, we're going to go to Steve. He has a, Steve has a mention about a festival. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Bernard. Well, it, it's actually generally about a Jodrell Bank to begin with. Um, the Lovell Telescope was the first of its kind and, and kind of pioneered the new science of radio astronomy. Uh, those of you who may have walked the Pennines and looked across the Cheshire Plain or landed at Manchester Airport and looked southwards, you'll see the Lovell Telescope sitting like a beautiful white pearl in the green Cheshire landscape. And now um, Jodrell Bank what was formerly the Discovery Center now has a brand new, uh, very spectacular building uh, called the First Light Pavilion. And it's now the Jodrell Bank Center for engagement as a result. And um, the building is actually the largest dome of its kind, I believe, in Europe. And it's actually a mirror image of the telescope itself. It's the same diameter yeah. and the same curvature tipped upside down. So it's a wonderful dome with a, a planetarium space dome, they call it, inside and a really good uh, exhibition that's got really, really good reports of those who have already visited. Um, it opened uh, two weeks ago on June the 4th and is now open from a Tuesday through to Sunday every week. Uh, and in fact, if you if anyone visits uh, there at weekends, you might see me there. But also mm -hmm. it's the uh, the sort of host site for the Blue Dot Festival, which has been going uh, until the uh, pandemic interrupted things for a couple of years has been going a number of years and building larger and larger each year. It's a science and music festival, and it is happening in about a month's time, from the 24, 21st rather to the 24th of July. That's a Thursday through to a Sunday. Uh, some of the highlights, uh, Tim Peake is there, and musically uh, Bjork with the Halley, Manchester's Halley Orchestra, and Groove Armada there. But it's uh, non-stop um, enjoyment for families uh, and uh, 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 science enthusiasts of all kinds, and not just astronomy, but, but science across the uh, its whole spectrum. So uh, I just uh, commend that to everybody, having been there uh, two or three times. It's very lively, very vibrant, and full of good things to enjoy. That's great. Das. das has a question. Um, just a just a quick thing. You mentioned the Level Telescope, and of course, we all know who Mr. Level was. Um, of course, he used a lot of um, ex Army surplus gear after the um, Second World War to start his radio um, observing, and he used to sit on a deck chair, and they'd be there with a pair of binoculars watching for meteorites, and then there'd be a chap sat in a little caravan with a big antenna on the top and he'd mark off the actual uh, signs of when the actual um, meteorites and they compared notes at the end of the day. So, uh, but also you mentioned the level um, uh, dish there. Well, of course that used battleship technology, the turntables, the original turntables were the turret turntables on battleships. 
that's and that's right, what they used right. to actually put on the bottom and so they could actually turn it so it's, it's a it's, bit it's, of a hodgepodge of an affair but it worked and it was a, a fantastic uh, well, an that, achievement and so you're absolutely right Daz. back then of course straight after the war there was a shortage of material shortage of labor and this was a complete experimental prototype so mm. they had to beg borrow and steal and uh, you're absolutely right the um the, the main uh, hinges, if you like, the pivots that turn the telescope tilted up and down were the original gun turrets from, I think it was HMS uh, Respite and HMS no, Royal no, Vanguard. Vanguard. Oh, Vanguard. Yeah. HMS Vanguard was that okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay? It was Stand Vanguard launched that, in, but... yeah, Vanguard was launched in 44. It was already obsolete, of course, so they dismantled it again. But fact, I well might the, be wrong. Uh, I thought it was Vanguard. Some yeah, of the, some could of be the wrong. original <laughs> telescope panels that were originally constructed are now oh. within the exhibition as the display screens. So oh. the original fabric's still there. And oh, in fact, okay. I think uh, uh, some of the gear from uh, one of the uh, original turrets is in the exhibition as oh, well. Yeah. Oh. oh, nice. Nice. Very good. Thanks, yeah. Ashley. Thank you. Well, thanks, Steve. Lots of good stuff. And uh, yeah, good, good topics and good music. What else do we need, eh? Um, <laughs> Live I'm going <laughs> to... Yeah. Yeah. Right, we're going to go on to, to Rachel now. Rachel Riot, because she has some <laughs> images to show us. Okay, I will share my screen. Um, I'm going to apologize again. Hay fever has sent my nasality to new astronomical levels, so <laughs> hopefully yeah. you'll uh, understand what I'm saying. Uh, and we'll go from there. Okay. So yeah, thank you for everybody who sent them in um, from last time. We've made a selection um, and you'll see them here. I think my bar isn't in front of the screen for everybody, is it? No, no. Awesome. no. Okay, so a popular target from last week. I think it's inspired Lee, um, who is watching as well tonight. Hi, Lee, uh, from Cornwall. He sent in um, his image of the North American Nebula. So this one he's took over three sessions. Um, and uh rachel i have to stop you i i'm only seeing half of the image yeah that's okay it comes this is just the information <laughs> oh sorry um so here's lee's image Ooh, wow nice. um which and i followed lee right from sort of his his the start of his journey and he's he just seems to have really settled in and found his own now he's just really doing so well um amazing look at that and yeah, I think, again, everybody's version of this that we see is so different. And I love looking yeah. at everybody's different take on the colours. And Well done, Lee. That's fantastic. Yeah, on the right yeah. side, you can see the star formation in the, uh, yeah, the top yeah, of these can. things. Absolutely fantastic. Nice. Yeah. Love it. Yep. Uh, then another popular target, we've got um, this one by Kai, who sent in his rosette, or NGC 2237. Um, this one, he says, it's approximately 12 hours integration time. So well done on the patience on that one, Kai. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he said this is one of his best and favorite images. Um, he's learned a lot about why data is important, but more importantly, how to get the most out of that data. And here's Kai's image. Oh, wow. wow. Which, That's brilliant, nice. Kai. Super. Yeah. So really, I really do like this target. And I think there's so many different things you can see at different rotations. Like in one, Johnny swear he sees a skull. In another one, you see a really vivid rosette. So I think depending on the orientation of it, you get a completely different view. Yeah. Then we've got The Sun um, by Kev, who again, I know is watching. Um, and he's took this on the 14th of June. Um, Kev's talked about how he's had to overexpose the sun's disk to better capture the fainter chromosphere and prominences. And then he's masked the disk black in the process to accentuate those. And because this is a mono image, he's had to colorize them with Photoshop levels and selective color. And here. Oh, oh wow. Wow. Now I've tried to image the sun and failed. <laughs> really, <laughs> really spectacularly failed. So as much as I'm not good at it, but I do, I do like seeing things like this. I just think you're drawn into them. So a really lovely image. Brilliant image, Kev. Well done. That's superb. And then another rosette to finish. Um, oh. And this one's by Ed, um, Ed Holt. And what I love about Ed's as well is he he shows just what can be done with a DSLR rather than a full dedicated astro camera. Um, so he's given us lots of information here. Um, five and a half hours 
of uh, integration time. And I just love this quote. Not sure how it happened. I just pointed my camera at the sky and clicked. Then this turned up. <laughs> and I would be chuffed if this turned up because. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And he's obviously got the uh, cluster oh, in the middle. Good. Is it yeah. NGC 2244? Uh, which is the rare O type stars, isn't it, in the middle? So. Yeah. Again, completely different to Lee's. It's like you know, a completely different color spectrum. You just get a different image each time somebody does it. And yeah, they're all beautiful. So thank you for everyone oh, for sending well, them in. Yeah. Well and, done. And uh, I will put details in the chat of um, how to send in if you want your selected. Maybe not for next week if we've got a quiz, but maybe for the week after. Yeah, for the week after, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well done. Well done, everybody. Well, um, yeah. Thank you so much for submitting them. They're, they're, they're fantastic. We do love looking at them. Absolutely. Um, please do submit some more because uh, we really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Rachel, for those. Uh, really good. Cool. Um, we're going to go to Michael now. Michael has uh, something to tell us about Boeing. Yes. Uh, just one. Uh, I've done just done a quick presentation. If I can share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, we can. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, okay. Looking good. Basically, uh, this is about the Boeing Starliner crew flight test, uh, which now has a uh, crew assignment update. Um, crew, uh, the Boeing Starliner is Boeing's version of the uh, SpaceX Dragon uh, for taking uh, astronauts to the space station. Uh, SpaceX Dragon, as you know, has been operational now, now for a couple of years, taking uh, astronauts to the ISS. Uh, uh, Boeing Starliner has uh, had uh, several de development problems and ha has only recently uh, uh, done a, a flight test so without any crew to the ISS. Um, and uh, we're still looking, now looking for a, a crew flight test uh, sometime later this year. And what they've uh, said is that uh, I'll just go through and a few slides showing what the Starliner looks like on the launch pad. Um, I mean, it's in the modified launch tower there with the, the crew access uh, facility. And um, this was the launch of the uh, test flight back in uh, 2019, the first actual test flight um, um, back in 2019. <clears throat> okay, and this is look, looks how it would look like if you, you could see it from orbit uh, going into space. Um, right, and the uh, picture of the, an, an artist impression picture of the uh, docking uh, mechanism just before docking to the ISS. So um, uh, this has only taken place as a, an uncrewed test so far. Um, and as I said, we're still waiting for a crewed test for this particular spacecraft. Uh, and the crew is going to be uh, Barry Wilmore, um, who was assigned in uh, 2020 to the mission. Um, and, but so the recent uh, change is uh, Sonny Williams is now going to be the pilot of the mission. And uh, Sonny replaces uh, Nicole Mann, uh, who, was, um, uh, who had a reassignment of, uh, of her flight on the um, uh, Dragon Crew 5 mission uh, coming up. So there's been a few uh, swap rounds of uh, assignments for various astronauts. So that's, uh, and both these, uh, as you probably know, have done um, long duration flights on the uh, ISS. They're very experienced astronauts. Um, so they're, they're quite well they're trained as a, as a uh, flight test. And they're uh, two very, very, very brave people. <laughs> very, brave, very, very, very brave people, yes, yes. Uh, just so you know, Nick, this is Nick Oldman on the left, um, is going on to the uh, uh, Crew 5 of the Dragon. And Mike Fink, who was uh, an operations uh, manager, uh, will now train as uh, Sonny Williams is uh, back up as a pilot on the uh, um, Crew 5 test. Uh, but as of yet, um, I, I don't believe we have any uh, set date for the crew flight test. Uh, we're still waiting on, um, uh, you know, things to go on with the uh, uncrewed flight test um, to, to, before we can get a, a proposed debate for the crew test. So that's what I wanted to um, let you know, that the crew has changed uh, again. 
for the uh, crew flight test of the um, Boeing Starliner. So I think they, so they've said late this year, early next year. Yeah, they? that's what I said. Yeah, I say late this year, definitely. Um, but um, you know, we we don't have any, not even a month yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Daz. Uh, yeah, it's just a quick um. Uh, I've just seen a message go through from Bass Astronomers again asking okay. how the SLS um, wet rehearsal is going. Um, well, they've uh, I've got it on another screen here. Of course, I can't hear the sound. But what I can see, they've got um, the LH2 is uh, loading is complete. Uh, LOX is in progress. Uh, CS fueling complete. But the teams now have an LH2 quick release leak uh, to contend with. So... Uh, they're finding more leaks, uh, unfortunately, oh, yeah, in the more, system. So, um, yeah, mm -hmm. it's uh, so that's how that's going. How's and that the, was for um, Bath the Astronomy. Looking, does what well, for on theirs? Um, it's 41 40. They got 40 odd minutes left to go, right? Um, right. but they're working as I says at the moment, they're working this leak. Uh, I think that's yeah. the second leak they found because I think there was something on the quick release, um, uh. Right pipes as well so yeah we'll we'll, we'll find out towards the, plumber, the end don't they or, or i don't know why nasa just can't hire a, you know murphy's plumbing or whatever just <laughs> go along there with his bag of tools and some you know yeah. some plumbers maids and just just you know plug the holes it's easy yeah. i'd do it i'd do it i'd do it for a very yeah. if in date give it a clout yeah um but yeah <laughs> use the old knockometer yeah, yeah that's the one yeah. Hammer. <laughs> full beam hammer why not just turn it off and turn it on so Good that they're being so <laughs> thorough. Yeah, there are there are a million parts that have to work yeah, uh, yeah. flawlessly. And, so it's, uh, of course. And, get million, it. and get millions it right. of dollars at stake as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And also, we need this for uh, to get back to the moon. So. Oh yeah, definitely. We do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good luck. Thanks for that, Michael. Okay. Oh. Muted, Bernard. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> right, we're um, we're slowly approaching the hour. Keith, do you want to uh, do you want to share your topic about satellites? Uh, yeah. Or I do you want to push do. it for next week? It's, I it's think your you call. should push it because it's not time dependent. It's not news. It's yeah. just okay stuff. <laughs> um, I've just got a couple of little quick I mean, things. Not, not next week. The week after. The yeah. week after. Yeah. Right, yeah. Week after. Okay. Yeah. I got a couple of quick news items oh. that we can just fill the time with. Um, unfortunately, one of them is sad news. And it's to do with the Voyagers. That unfortunately, they, it looks like we are going to lose them before oh. they reach their anniversary. Oh. Um, they, um, of course, they were launched in nineteen. Let me just get this right. Seventy-seven. Seven, uh, Seventy-seven. Um, uh, they've been going all that time. Um, they've been trying to save them uh, by powering down different systems using different configurations, um, powering them down. Uh, they were hoping to uh, that they can keep them going until 2025 now, um, but they don't think they're going to be able to get it to uh, 1927, of course, which would be the anniversary. Um, it's very, very sad. These were um, groundbreaking probes. Um, they showed us the outer planets for the first time. Um, and it's just a very sad state of affairs. I followed them since they were first launched. Um, and... Um, it's it's just it's going to be a sad day. There'll be a tear in my eye. Of course, we had the um, the same sort of sentiment when was it was it the Gaia mission crashed into uh, Saturn and that and everybody weeped a tear. Cassini. 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 Sorry, Cassini. I do apologise. I do mm. apologise. Like, what am I talking about, Gaia? Anyway, yeah. yeah so <laughs> that, that yeah, the Cassini. Emotional. Everybody shed a tear. That'd be that interesting. Was that, was, that, was, night, that was that was um, that, that was another. Uh, Brain breaking uh, thing. Um, mm. And the other quick one um, is uh, oh, oh, I've already mentioned that, haven't I, about SpaceX? Mm. Um, that they've actually uh, going to um, not permit um, SpaceX to launch Starships from Cape Canaveral. Um, and uh, the reason for that is, is that uh, they think his uh, gun ho ways of uh, letting things launch and then just crash back down to Earth isn't for them at Cape Canaveral and of course his launch pad that he's building for the Starship is right next to mm. um, the launch pad 39A which is used again by SpaceX right. but that's yeah. for the um, Crew Dragon to go up yeah. to the ISS and they just do not want any risk of damaging any of the launch pads and all that so there's been a ban on him uh, for the moment launching anything 
any starships from there. And of course, it just adds to his woes that he's got all the condition, uh, terms and conditions that he's got to meet before he can mm. launch at Boca Chica as well. Mm. So it's a watch this space scenario. So hopefully, how, how, how far have they got with the launch pad, uh, Daz? Uh, for what I understand, they've got quite a long way. Um, okay. They're quite a way into it. But now mm. um, they, they, they were um, in an hour beforehand, NASA, about whether or not to um, let him do test uh, of the Starship. Um, but uh, now they're saying definitely there's going to be a no. I mean, yeah, but I mean, uh, thinking about it, Pad 39A and 39B are so so far apart for a reason, aren't they? <laughs> You know? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they, you can actually, you know, they're all literally right next door to each other. So, um, uh, th three days ago, I think it was Michael, they rolled the first four levels of the launch tower uh, out to where it's going to be built. All um, right. So, you know, they're, they're fairly well advanced already. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Hey, guys, I, I have to, I have to make a, of course, I have to make a comment about Voyager. Yeah. Of course, I, of course I saw would. that, I saw that article. I looked for uh, a second and third source. I couldn't find it. Apparently, that's that's real now. Um, I just want to make the point that Voyager has done its job yeah. over mm -hmm. over many decades. And as we as we say in the industry, as we say at NASA, we stand on the shoulders of giants. The next mission to go out uh, that far will be Interstellar Probe, which I th think I. Th Think is scheduled for something like 500 AU out to the outer solar system much faster right. than anything else we've sent, uh, and so we uh, we are not through with the uh, interstellar medium yet. Yeah, of course we've um, was it Voyager one? I think one of the greatest images it ever took was of the pale blue dot. Um, yeah, um, and uh, th that just put, it puts everything into perspective mm -hmm. as regards. Of, and, and of course, New Horizons is is well on its way out as yeah. well. Oh yeah, that's true. Steve wants to tell you something. Before but you say it, Steve, I just wanted to say say on the back of thank you on the back of uh, Lou as well, actually, that um uh it, the the original images from Voyager are kind of swamped with huge amounts of information mm -hmm. since, but <clears> I don't remember another um uh, mission in my lifetime that had such a dramatic impact uh mm. instantly of every object it visited and revealed there was just a total revelation that that, that we had Absolutely. very little concept of before obviously hubble has done its work since about deep space but voyager i will never forget mm. yeah. yeah absolutely definitely we'll miss you voyager we really will <laughs> I think uh, I think we will uh, slowly end the show on this uh, on this uh, good note and sad notes yeah. about yeah. Uh, yeah. about Voyager. Um, so great! I thought it was a, it was a great show today. Uh, we've learned a lot as usual, and we've had fun. Uh, thank you very much for all our viewers and our panelists here. Let's all give ourselves a round of applause. Yes, thank you. Don't forget well done, to hit everyone. that like don't, and don't subscribe. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Yeah, go on. Mm. Absolutely. Like and subscribe and put comments. We will read them and we will go through them. Now, next week, as Andy said, we have an exciting week because we're going to have a quiz. So uh, stay tuned. We're going to uh, try and bring, bring even more enjoyment into this channel. So... Yeah. From, from me and from all of us, uh, thank you so much for following and see you next week. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. Thank Good you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.